And um, so I was interested in maybe a bit of a different uh, uh, point of view after photothermal excitation, namely the fate of the actual nanoparticles and, uh, and even the atoms in the nanocrystal um, upon photothermal excitation. So, um, uh, and I will run you through uh, my thoughts. But first, of course, um, I don't need to uh, tell you, I guess, why we are all excited about plasmonic nanomaterials. Uh, of course, they're highly tunable and um, shape uh, basically dic dictates almost everything um, in, in terms of optical properties. And upon absorption and scattering, yeah, we can on the one hand concentrate the light, but more importantly, that's why we're all here, we can um, uh, locally uh, generate heat. So because we are now confined to the nanoscale um, uh, and interested mainly in these uh, anisotropic uh, nanoparticles, um, we, we actually run into one problem, uh, namely that they are not, uh, not as stable as we would hope for. So for gold, right, the bulk melting temperatures like on the order of 1000, 64 degrees, um, but we see in like actual experiments that uh, anisotropic nanoparticles reshape uh, at the temperatures hundreds of degrees below that. So here you can see for um, uh, gold nanorods that already at 200 degrees, they're basically um, more or less uh, deformed towards their thermodynamically stable shape. And this does not only happen if you put them in the oven, such as done here, but also under photothermal excitation. Uh, and you, I guess you might have also encountered this in your experience, uh, experiments where you see that then um, the, the optical properties change because these are of course connected. And on the, on the other hand, you can also see that um, compositional changes can occur if you have more than, more than one material, such as for example, here in these gold silver nanoparticles, which uh, start to alloy upon uh, elevated temperature. So on the one hand, um, we, we don't like that, right? Um, uh, chemists do a beautiful job in uh, creating all sorts of novel morphologies. And um, if, if, that, if that occurs, then we lose these carefully designed plasmonic properties. Um, we might also change the chemical reactivity if we're interested in using them, for example, in um, uh, catalytic uh, reactions. But on the other hand, it also gives us a new, new tool because we can now create uh, novel systems that are not easily um, uh, creatable from uh, collo colloidal synthesis. And an example is here, uh, the work that has been done in uh, Luis's Mazan's group, where they used um, femtosecond laser excitation to um, uh, assemble nanorods, but also to like uh, weld them, gently weld them together. And uh, we've looked at uh, together at some of these um, effects that, that can occur. And uh, as a motivation, you, ca you can see that you can really create um, fascinating shapes by making use of photothermal excitation, actually. So on the one hand here, you can see um, hollow nanocrystals that uh, have been generated um, by excitation with nanosecond pulses. And um, also local tuning of compositions becomes, uh, becomes possible. Uh, as shown here for these gold silver um, nanorods, which have been excited at different powers. And you can already see that uh, there, there's a large variety of parameters you can tune and you can look at, and that, uh, that already gives you maybe an idea of how complex uh, the whole process is. And I was interested in, in looking into, into more detail and the remainder of the talk, I would like to share some of the insights we got at uh, what is actually happening um, even down, down to the atomic scale uh, upon photothermal excitations of um, plasmonic um, nanoparticles. So of course, um, as, as you're all aware, so first the, the electronic system absorbs uh, the, the energy of the laser pulse and then it thermalizes with the lattice via, via electron phonon scattering and afterwards releases the, the heat um, to the surroundings. So now it uh, critically depends on how fast you actually deposit uh, that uh, energy, right? So if you're coming with a femtosecond laser pulse, um, uh, well, the uh, actually all of the energy is basically uh, basically absorbed. Um, um, if you come with a nanosecond pulse, so even longer, then you're basically competing also with cooling. So um, this has been also shown um, experimentally where, where people looked at what are some of the parameters that influence these uh, reshaping mechanisms and the pulse length is a very critical factor. So this is some of the earlier work from uh, Stefan Link where, where he looked at um, nanosecond versus femtosecond excitation. And because with nanosecond excitation, you compete with cooling, you basically always need higher um, pulse energies to, to achieve uh, similar kind of uh, deformations. 
but of course also to keep in mind that you heat for a longer time and this will become um, critically uh, later on as well the, the time you give the nanoparticle um, for heating. Then of course the pulse fluence has been seen to be very important because it's uh, as you know directly related to the temperature you can achieve um, and in the, in the last year, some people have looked at the influence of the environment. And this is very important because it completely determines your heat dissipation properties. And what might have been elected a bit in colloidal systems is the um, uh, layer that you, the, the ligand layer that you have on top of your, of your colloidal system. And um, it was seen that this uh, can, can lead to an additional uh, interface resistance um, and really uh, influences your, your heat dissipation properties. And uh, again, in, uh, in Louis' group, they, they, have, they have tweaked it. And they saw that if you go above the critical micelle concentration of these CTAP layers, you actually um, uh, uh, you hinder heat dissipation and you, you, you deform these gold nanorods, um, uh, which are originally the, the red curve, into like, yeah. Um, something that you cannot control. But if you stay at the critical micelle concentration, they, they showed that this is a solution, that you can get um, a spectrum of these nanorod solution, which is close to, to a single nanoparticle, meaning that you could reshape all of them gently um, into almost uh, the same shape. And this was by controlling, controlling the heat dissipation, because um, now um, with the help of water, they could have a bit faster heat dissipation, um, which allowed for more gently uh, reshaping. And what has also been recognized um, uh, lately is that morphology plays an important role, not only in the absorption cross section, but also in the actual uh, driving force for deformation. So um, in uh, Adam Taylor's work, they have shown that uh, if you have uh, gold nanorods and you make the aspect ratio larger, actually the activation energy of reshaping them goes down. And that is because um, the, basically, the more out of equilibrium the particle, the more it really strives towards getting into its equilibrium shape, which is a truncated octahedron for a nanoscale gold. And um, we've visualized that in the electron microscope um, with electron tomography, uh, very heated uh, nanocrystals. And you could see here for this uh, gold uh, nano star that indeed these areas with like very high uh, curvatures, surface curvatures deformed first. So these red areas where, where atoms diffuse away and they diffuse towards these green areas, which are areas of low curvature. So we really have this driving force from high curvature to low curvature. Um, and this, this we saw for different, different shapes. So I've been like interested in, as I said, what happens at the atomistic scale and what's the atomistic mechanism. And, um, and, and there basically what, what I've now shown you is that on the one hand, you have this curvature driven um, effect, um, which uh, yeah, Adam Taylor said is, the, is the, basically the atomistic driving force. But uh, um, it has also been reported that um, local melting occurs and uh, crystal defects occur within the particle, which uh, is uh, one of the mechanisms for reshaping. And uh, other people have recently shown uh, by in situ studies in the electron microscope that this reshaping depends on the morphology of your particle. So it can either be curvature driven or facet driven if you have strong surface facets such for the triangle. So we went ahead and we, we wanted to do that um, at the single particle level. And we basically did these um, photothermal excitations of the same gold nanorods here coated with a thin uh, silica layer um, and looked at the same particle before and after um, femtosecond laser excitation and then looked at these different, um, yeah, environments and different energies um, of the reshaping uh, mechanism. So um, what, I've, what I'd already noticed in these uh, preliminary experiments was that uh, there's a connection also to uh, the crystallinity of the, um, of the system. So I went ahead and I thought, okay, let's, let's do it with atomic um, resolution. And this is what you see here. And this is what the remainder of the talk will actually be about. So this is a gold nanorod. Um, the same gold nanorod before and after femtosecond laser excitation. It also has a, a silica shell. You don't see it uh, in the contrast, but the first two observations you can already see in this 2D uh, projection is that, well, it shortens. Um, uh, this is not surprising, but that you have all these uh, parallel twinning defects uh, that you see here in blue. So in order to now really quantify what is going on, 
we actually need the full 3D uh, information. And um, well, this is what we did. And this is just a short intermezzo of how this actually works. So in the um, electron microscope, you can tilt your particle. Um, so you tilt your holder and you get projection images from different directions. And then you can basically um, uh, uh, use uh, uh, mathematical algorithms to calculate the three-dimensional shape of your nanoparticle, but not only the shape, but real, the real um, three-dimensional volume. Um, and for this specific nanorod that I showed you, we saw that 9% uh, of the volume um, we distributed. And uh, not surprisingly, atoms from the, from the tips um, diffused to, to the sides. So um, uh, from higher curvature to lower curvature. Um, and what we could also now see is like what happened to the, to the surface facets. And um, the more stable 111 facets um, increased at the expense of less stable 110 and 100 facets. So now, ideally, um, we would have loved to do this experiment also with femtosecond time resolution, um, but this is a very challenging experiment. So, and we got the time resolution from using the um, input from our tomography data in uh, molecular dynamics simulations. And first we compared what actually does the silica coating to our nanoparticle. And this is what you can see here. So we have the same gold nanoparticles, just they start off with a single crystalline FCC lattice, um, uh, different aspect ratios. And uh, if when we add the silica coating, you can see that the heat that is generated in the particle, um, so the lattice temperature because of the femtosecond laser um, excitation, um, the, the maximum temperature does not change so much, but you can see that the heat dissipation is influenced by the silica coating. Um, and this is because silica is a bit of a reverse thermal conductor um, than the surrounding glycerol that we had otherwise. Um, and so you basically delay this heat dissipation a bit more. And what you can see is that the final structure also changes. So the, under silica coating, the particles are much more stable and they are also more ordered. You do have these twinning defects, which are shown here in red, um, uh, but um, uh, they are not as disordered as without the coating. And there are two, uh, two factors. So on the one hand, because of the slower cooling, you give the system a bit more time to recrystallize into um, a preferred system, which is always a single crystalline FCC crystal. Um, but also the silica confinement simply um, hinders atoms to diffuse and basically yeah, slows down the deformation process. So if you look at a bit more detail, we see that the deformation is really, um, so the aspect ratio change it's really um, during, only during the heating time, um, which, is not, which is not surprising. But uh, yeah, that, that also means if you give it a bit more time to heat, for example, by nanosecond excitation, um, uh, you, you will already get a very different result. So if you would heat the same system at the same temperature for a longer time, of course, you will also get more deformation, right? So you really limit your, the time the particle stays hot and the deformation that can achieve. So this is one parameter to tweak um, the, the morphology that you get in the end. So then you can see the evolution of uh, surface facets uh, towards the more stable 111 facets where the whole surface basically starts to restructure. And um, if you look inside the nanoparticle, we see that indeed the single crystalline FCC um, starts to get disordered around the maximum of the heating pulse. And then uh, this order turns into, um, over time, turns into these uh, twinning defects. And the twinning planes actually get pushed away. And why the twinning occurs um, is coming from the, from the surface. So this silica confinement leads to propagation of surface defects. Um, so the strain, yes, this is the strain in the system. And you can see that it is like starts from the, due to surface diffusion at the silica confinement at the surface, and then propagates through the crystal um, by formation of these twinning defects uh, together with the, like, yeah, the, the locally melted um, atoms. So all of these are basically um, yeah, intertwined and occur, and occur together. Um, so you first start off with um, surface diffusion, uh, then atoms feel, or the, the system feels strained due to that and evolves into these, uh, single, uh, and these uh, um, single crystalline with, uh, yeah, uh, lattice uh, defects. So what is actually more complicated than that, and there was something that really fasc fascinated me, because if we now compare the model-like structure of the same aspect ratio and the same volume compared to the one that we measured um, from tomography before 
um, femtosecond laser excitation, we see different results. Um, so here you can see the aspect ratio change. So you can see that the real, uh, so the measured morphology um, is less stable. So the, the nanoparticle deforms more and you can also see that in the side view uh, and in the, in the cut um, through uh, the, the lengths of the nanoparticle uh, shown below. And this is because the, the actual nanoparticle is not perfect. It has like unfinished uh, surface um, edges, as you can see here, it has kinks and steps where atoms can more easily diffuse to. Um, so they do not have to create a completely new atomic layer. And uh, interestingly, the um, change in surface facets was stronger for the model-like one. So you can see that the 111 facets were more created in the model-like structure. Uh, and this is because it started off with like um, uh, um, uh, smaller areas of 111 facets, but uh, energetically it likes to increase its uh, uh, yeah, area on 111 facets. So it's really an interplay. So it's an interplay of changing the aspect ratio, but at the same time also the yeah trying to lower the energy by getting more of these 111 facets. And in both cases, this came at the expense of um, internal um, crystal defects. So now looking back um, at this picture, we can actually say that it's not either or, but it, it, it always depends and it's always interconnected. And it really comes down to like, yeah, single atoms uh, in your structure, how, what kinetic pathway is taken and to actually restructure. And I would like to um, show you one example of um, where this atomic engineering can actually be, be interesting. And this is coming back to these welded uh, nanocrystals, um, gold nanorods, where we saw with, uh, again, electron tomography, that we have one um, uh, crystal defect at the interface. So there was either a grain boundary, as shown here, um, or a dislocation. But there was always one defect in, at the interface. So now I thought this is a perfect system to see what this one defect does um, to our plasmon. And um, uh, we, we uh, measured the plasmonic response by electron energy loss spectroscopy inside the electro, uh, electron microscope and compared it to single gold nanorods um, at the same uh, resonance energy. And for all of the welded nanoparticles with our one um, uh, uh, defect, we could actually see that um, uh, the, the line width was significantly increased. So this one defect already uh, caused uh, quite significant uh, damping uh, to the plasma, which I found uh, quite fascinating. And um, uh, I'm uh, happy to, to end with like uh, what, what is coming next. Uh, and uh, that is that we will now be able to do or soon be able to do these experiments in situ inside the electron microscope, because we'll get a new microscope next year where we have laser and coupling um, and we can look at, um, yeah, among other things, photothermal transformations uh, inside. And you can see here an example of uh, in such an experiment of these gold nanorods, um, where we come closer to the, uh, yeah, to the possibility to then also measure the dynamic changes um, with atomic resolution um, and, uh, yeah, in a dynamic uh, kind of way. Um, so here you can see that this is actually not a static, of course, um, and that there's a lot going on and a lot more to, to try and understand. So with that, I would like to conclude and I hope that I have shown you that the uh, structure um, uh, properties and stability are highly intertwined uh, in these nanoscale systems. And that it's important to, to perform single particle measurements. Um, and moreover that, yeah, laser radiation um, and uh, specifically tuning the, yeah, the excitation scheme is a great tool for nanoscale engineering. Um, that the mechanism, how these uh, transformations happen, are actually quite complex. That on the one hand, we, the particle deforms towards a thermodynamically stable shape by a surface diffusion. But at the same time, it also tries to create as many low energy surface facets as, as possible at the cost of internal defects, which are relatively cheaper for FCC crystals. And we've seen that surface disorder actually destabilizes the particles. And um, with that, I would like to um, yeah, thank my collaborators. So uh, that has really been a work with like, uh, yeah, the electron microscopy people involved. I would like to thank also my group. Um, uh, and I would like to thank you for your uh, attention.
Thank you very much for this exciting talk and the exciting look into the structure of single nanorods. Are there questions? Michel, of course, has a question. Uh, yes, thanks a lot, uh, Wiebke. <clears throat> I was uh, wondering, um, uh, in our experience, I thought, at least in, from the literature also, that often when do you reshape nanorods, uh, you often obtain this uh, so-called uh, doggy bone uh, shape where the ends become fatter than the middle and you didn't see that. So is that due to the to the silica shell or can you can you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, so I think that really depends also on the, uh, first of all, on the excitation scheme. So if you have a nanosecond pulses, you get these like um, dog-shaped or yeah, phi-shaped particles a bit more. Um, because you already start cooling and you start cooling more of one, like the, the, the tips of the particles than the middle. So you have also like a, a temperature gradient. Um, it also depends on the, the size of the particles, right? So at some point um, you cannot assume that there's a homogeneous temperature distribution anymore. Specifically, if also already the tips start to cool down faster than the middle. But I think all of these factors really influence um, how that works. So in our case, these particles were very small. Um, because otherwise we cannot do electron tomography with atomic resolution, so they need to be very small. So we can really assume somewhat um, homogeneous uh, temperature distribution. Okay, so much more, uh, you know, than just uh, simple uh, interpretations. Uh, you really have yeah. to go deep into yeah, exactly. the physics of these objects. Okay, yeah, thank you exactly. very much. Other questions? Otherwise, I would, would ask uh, quickly uh, for the role of the electric fields of the laser actually in that whole restructuring process overall, because um, that is some additional, not only heat generation, but um, some additional field which is present. Uh, yeah, so that has been seen to play a role if you go like even higher and you go towards fragmentation. Okay. Um, so they're like if really parts of the particle are like ejected, that uh, has been shown to follow also laser polarization directions and so on. So for these um, lower uh, fields, I think I, at least I have not seen um, a strong influence. But if you if you go in that direction, then for sure it becomes important. Yeah. Okay. Additional questions. So yeah, I'm wondering that how uh, the cooling rate can influence on the reshaping of the particles. So for example, if you don't measure in air or vacuum, but put into some medium, and then the gradient will be probably plays role as well, right? Yeah, so this was um, basically, so this was always now in a medium, um, right? So, and if you, in liquid, in, well, these experiments were actually in glycerol. So this plays an important role, the cooling. So for example, here, you can see that there's a, a tiny difference in cooling, but um, or in heat dissipation, the silica goes just a bit slower than uh, just in pure glycerol. Um, but that gives the particle a bit more time and it's somewhat elevated, mm -hmm. more elevated temperature to restructure a bit more into like its uh, preferred uh, configuration. Basically, so it plays an it plays an important role in that in that sense. Um, also, in the group of Luis's Mazan, where they have shown this, um, yeah, restructuring into almost a, yeah, single aspect ratio or nanorods, this was very important. That only worked at that one specific cooling time because this was like a sweet spot, basically, where the particle had just enough time at the at the elevated temperature to basically restructure um, to these configurations. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and also has a question. You have shown this tendency nicely from the low um, high curvature to low curvature moving movement, and are asking for the atomic mechanisms. Uh, did, can you explain this in terms of energetics, like surface tension or the energy from the curving, or other other mechanisms involved? Uh, yeah, so so indeed it's it's related to that. And um, in this paper of um, yeah from Adam Taylor, they connected it to some old um, uh, old uh, theory actually um, of this uh, curvature reshaping of some uh, some uh, I think uh, tips it was. So they yeah you can really uh, boil that down to some older theory as well. Um, indeed. Okay. 
So if you're interested, mm -hmm. um, the details are indeed uh, yeah, also described in this paper. Thank you.